Good afternoon, everyone. I'll just give a couple seconds to make sure everybody's into Zoom land before we get started. All right, I think we should be good. Um, good afternoon again. My name is Chris Crawford. I'm a policy advocate at Protect Democracy, and we really appreciate all of you joining us today. For the past two years, Protect Democracy and our partners, including Campaign Legal Center, Issue One, and many others, have been educating the public about the Electoral Count Act of 1887, and we've been advocating for updates to this outdated statute in order to protect the will of the voters and ensure the peaceful transfer of power in future elections. So of course we welcome today's development of Senator Collins, Manchin, and a larger bipartisan group of 16 senators introducing a bill to reform the ECA. We've assembled our own bipartisan group. This one is a panel of experts to discuss and analyze the legislation and most importantly, answer questions about this breaking news. We are joined by my colleague, jean Viev Nato, a counsel at Protect Democracy, Trey Grayson, the former Republican Secretary of State of Kentucky, former president of the National Association of Secretaries of State, and Adav Noti, vice president and legal director at Campaign Legal Center. I do just off the top here, want to let you all know you can submit your questions for our speakers via the Zoom chat at any time during our program. And I think we'll start with you, jean Viev. Why don't we just start with, can you please give us an overview of what the Electoral Count Act is and what some of the proposed reforms are? Thank you. Great, thanks, Chris. So the Electoral Count Act, the ECA, um, is a, you know, a federal law, a very old one, that governs the casting and counting of electoral college votes for president and vice president every four years. So it, it governs most of what happens during the time period from election day in November to the electoral college meeting in December and then to January 6th when Congress meets to count electoral votes. Um, you know, it has become clear in recent elections, particularly the 2020 election, that the statute you know, is, is vague, it has antiquated and undefined language, and that it's really badly in need of an update, um, particularly if it's going to successfully take us through future presidential elections. Um, so the bill released today, I think, really grapples with the weaknesses in current law um, in, a, in, in a way on which there is evidence not only by the bill itself, but by sort of you know, broader landscape, really cross-partisan consensus on, on how those weaknesses need to be addressed. And, and you know, if passed, you know, it would go a long way towards, I think, securing presidential elections uh, in the future. So you know, at a high level, the bill doesn't change in any dramatic way the way we would elect presidents in this country. Um, what it does is it brings more clarity and certainty to the process, and I think strikes a good and better balance between the different you know, person, people and institutions involved in the process, particularly states versus Congress and the role of the courts, the vice president, of course, as well. Um, and it really, it really sort of at a high level reigns in what we've now identified as opportunities for misunderstanding or even exploitation of the statute. So I'll sort of stop there with that, with the high level take on it. Great, thank you very much. And Adav, you've been in the weeds of this statute for a while. Uh, what's your initial reaction to this legislation? Do you think that this proposed legislation provides the necessary updates to fix the Electoral Count Act? I think it does. And, and before even getting into the weeds, I mean, just to sort of emphasize something that jean have touched on, but the, the whole point of this effort to fix the ECA is to meaningfully reduce the opportunities for any political actor, federal or state, to sabotage a presidential election after election day. And that, that's the purpose of this. And the, the bill that was um, uh, released today would meaningfully reduce the opportunities for any state or federal actor to sabotage a presidential election after election day. So it, it would accomplish that, that goal. So how, how would it do that? Um, so there's some, some pretty significant fixes that would make to existing law. 
One that was very, uh, very much at issue in the period uh, immediately after the 2020 presidential election is a provision in the existing Electoral Count Act that says that you know a, a state has to uh, conduct its presidential election by election day and appoint its members of the Electoral College based on the results of that election, unless the state has, quote, failed to make a choice on election day. That's the language in the existing ECA. And it's a uh, very old language, completely archaic. Its meaning has been lost to time. And the, the ambiguity of that phrase was exploited, um, particularly by, um, by President Trump and, and some of his allies in that post-election period to try to convince states to overturn the uh, popular election results in those states using that language from the ECA. So the, the, uh, the bill released today would eliminate that language and would replace it with a much clearer statement as to what, what the language is actually intended to mean, which is that you know, if there is some, if a disaster happens on election day, such that um, the, the, the presidential election can't be completed on that day, a state can, pursuant to pre-existing laws, extend the voting period to, to account, for that, um, account for that disaster. So that's sort of big fix number one. Um, big fix number two is the current ECA sort of refers to resolving disputes about who won a presidential election in a state, but it doesn't say how to do that, really. It just sort of says, um, gives a rough timeline for when, when dispute resolution should happen, but doesn't say how. The bill would provide for a very specific, highly expedited procedure for if there were a good faith dispute about whether a state's resolution of its presidential election complied with federal law or complied with the US Constitution, uh, there would be an opportunity for a candidate to bring a specific suit in federal court under federal law or the Constitution and to get a conclusive resolution to that dispute in a, in a very short period of time. And that resolution in federal court would then be binding uh, at all subsequent stages of the electoral vote counting process. So that's big fix number two. And then number three, which is sort of related to number two is, you know, as I think we all know by now, on January 6th, after the election, Congress needs to count the electoral votes. And uh, the existing ECA is incredibly um, uh, ambiguous in many respects as to how exactly that process is supposed to happen if there are disputes and how disputes get raised. And the bill would um, significantly clarify and limit the opportunities for members of Congress to um, second guess the results as they have gone through the, the dispute resolution process that I mentioned earlier. So those are major important fixes to existing law that would really reduce the opportunity for state or federal actors to um, try to overturn the popular vote. Uh, very quickly, a few other um, sort of more technical fixes that the bill would make. Uh, one, it would, under existing law, all it takes is one member of the US House and one member of the US Senate to object to electoral votes when they're counted on January 6th. That was a real problem uh, on January 6th, 2021. The bill would raise that minimum threshold to one fifth of both houses of Congress. So one fifth of the senators and one fifth of the members of the House would be needed to raise an objection. And it clarifies, the bill clarifies that the vice president, which honestly <laughs> we knew we knew before last election, but just to make abundantly clear, because um, you know, there were efforts to create ambiguity around this point that the vice president has no unilateral authority to determine who won the presidential election, of course. Um, so those are, I think those are the, the highlights. Great, thank you. And Secretary Grayson, we'll move to you. You bring an interesting perspective here because you have had to run elections at the state level. So what do you think of this bill and how it approaches the relationship between states and Congress? And what are some of the implications? First, I, I'm really excited about this bill. Um, I, first, to say it's occasionally Congress does actually legislate, and I realize this bill's got a long way to go; it hasn't even received a vote in the Senate, let alone in the House. Um, but it's it's really refreshing to see a group of senators work across party lines on something that's really important. 
Um, and I, 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 so I applaud the senators for, for this work. Um, yeah, it does create some, it does shift that dynamic. Adab was going through sort of, you know, point by point what the bill does, but to kind of zoom out, how does it change the state and, and um, federal dynamic? It protects each from bad actors in the other. You know, for example, we've seen over the last six presidential elections, four times members of Congress have objected during the vote count without any grounds um, for, for doing so because the, the the election had been settled, lawsuits had been settled, things had been resolved in the courts and under state rules. So this protects the states from, from bad congressional actors. And we saw you know, the, the biggest push this past time uh, by Republicans to try to overcome state rules, state, state processes. Um, but we'd seen Democrats in small numbers and not with a grand plan and really more for show um, do this as well. So it protects states from Congress trying to mess with that. It also says, Congress says to states, you have to set your rules in advance of election day. So you can't change things over if you don't like the result, you don't get a do over. Um, and, and that's an important protection for Congress and and, um, and actually for the states as well, you know, because because, you know, from each other and also the voters of the state, they get a chance to set their policies in advance of Election Day. Um, you want to run your election on those on those rules. So I think that's pretty um, that's pretty important. You know, in some of the vagueness, you know, this was this bill was written in an age in a horse and buggy era with you know, maybe we had a telegraph back in the 1870s. I can't remember my exact Timing of that, we certainly, you know, Al Gore had not invented the internet yet. So we were, the, we know on January 6th, who won the election. And so just clarifying all this, um, these different roles, I think provides really protection. Uh, and then finally, I think this, uh, the failed the failed electors scenario that Adav described, where if a state had to, you know, didn't submit electors or had a failed election, clarifying, you know, the, you, you, that it's not if you had excessive fraud or you didn't like the outcome, or you're trying to manufacture an election, it's, very specific criteria um, and with the denominator protection, things like that. So again, it, it's kind of protect, it, it's, it restores, I think the beauty of our federal system where we have this check and balance on one another, uh, but with clear rules. And, and that's what's the, what, that's what's so great about this proposal. Um, and so uh, yeah, it'll, I think restore the balance the way it should be. Thank you. And I'm actually gonna have you hit back to back here. Um, we're gonna shift a little bit from substance into the politics and the path forward here. I think a lot of people noticed today this bipartisan group had nine Republicans. And a lot of people are wondering, is there an opportunity here to get more Republicans on board? Are we stuck at nine? And some of what the path is from here. So as a Republican, former office holder, what are your thoughts on that dynamic here? So I, I think the fact that you start with nine is a really is a really good sign. You know, the reality is bills usually are not going to pass with, you know, just a barely the right number of Republicans. You're probably going to see several more. I know Leader McConnell from my state, um, he gave the negotiators, you know, free run. Said go go solve this problem, and that right there was an important signal um, of his support of the process. He hasn't indicated how he's going to vote, but I I would be shocked if he didn't vote in favor of this. Um, and I think with him and other members of the Republican leadership, my guess is they'll all sign on and we'll see a large number, not everybody. Um, there'll probably be some opportunities for some folks to try to vote no and knowing the bill is going to pass. Um, but I, I suspect you'll see a large number of Republicans sign on to this in the, in, the, in the Senate. And hopefully that'll be a nice signal to Republicans in the House where you'll get some sizable numbers in the House, um, although the, they're not as important there because you, you need the Republicans in the Senate for the filibuster. But it is an important signal to the country to have a large number of Republicans sign on to this legislation, and and I feel confident that we're gonna we're gonna see that. Great, thank you. And we are taking questions in the chat, just as a reminder. And I do see a question here about the case Moore v. Harper that's on the Supreme Court's docket next term. Um, could this bill give state courts any federal protections if the court rules they can't interfere with state election rules? I know she kicked that one to me, but I'd almost rather have it, Dob. Do you, that may be more in your uh, wheelhouse. Um, I'm getting there on this issue, but I, I'm, I'm worried I might say something from a, from a bit of ignorance. <laughs> I think John B. I was about to jump in. Okay. Yeah, let me let me let me start because it's, it's an important question. I think I'm going to dive. You can feel free to jump in as well, of course. Um, I think it's important to understand the difference between what 
the, the independent state legislature theory, it's a little mouthful, the ISL theory um, that is being raised in this case and the ECA, which are really for the most part, pretty distinct issues. So the, the, the independent state legislature theory is really about the, as, as the question indicates, the role of state courts and other state actors be, as compared to state legislatures in determining election rules, right? So it raises the question of whether what, what state legislatures do is subject to veto by a governor or checks and in interpretation by state courts under state law, uh, for example. It doesn't address the interaction between state and federal law. Um, so, th so this update to the ECA is really quite separate, uh, independent from the independent state legislature doctrine. Um, what, it, what it would do um, is clarify, you know, in terms of the, the courts, a role for the federal courts in ensuring that the federal duty under the ECA of states to ascertain their results and send those results to Congress is complied with in a way that comports with, you know, not just state law, but with federal law and the constitution. And importantly, and, and I just wanna flag a place where I think there's been some, some confusion between the different concepts that both Adav and Trey talked about, getting rid of the concept of failed elections that provision in current law is really what was behind some you know, arguments last time around um, that state legislatures could step in and have the authority to appoint electors. It was not an independent state legislature theory. It was really mostly about a misunderstanding of the current ECA. So this would really, this, this bill or some form of it, if enacted, would really go a long way towards fixing that. And let me give a couple, just a couple of just reminders of some failed elections that have happened, not necessarily in the presidential race, um, but you know, Hurricane Sandy hit right before the 2012 presidential election. Had it hit closer to election, you know, right on election day, um, had it been in some battleground states. I mean, 9/11 um, was a primary election day, and we canceled the election after voting and started pushed that election back. And so, those are the kinds of failed elections that we're trying to contemplate. Not a oh, we don't like the outcome. We're not sure how these rules were changed. But the, the you know we. These are, and this is why it's important to clarify because we've, we've had failed elections and we just have been fortunate that they haven't impacted a presidential election or come into, come into controversy you know, when it comes time to counting the electoral votes. And I'll just add one point on the, on the ISL or independent state legislature question that whatever the court does in that case, and that, I think that's a topic for a whole other briefing, um, whatever the court does, it, do, it will not give state legislatures the authority to appoint electors after election day. Because yeah. doing that would, violate federal law yeah um, yeah this makes it clear and I, that's a really thing good catch Jennifer. yeah i think that's really important to point out good stuff here so far adav do you have anything to add uh, one quick point on that there are there are all sorts of ways that the supreme courts uh embrace of some versions of the independent state legislature doctrine which is far from uh a foregone conclusion but there are all sorts of ways that that could create problems and even opportunities for subversion of elections. But those are largely, you know, actually to a, to a very significant extent, distinct from the sorts of subversion uh, uh, mechanisms that are addressed um, by the ECA. Great, thank you. Um, one question here, because there have been questions about previous efforts since the 2020 election focused on the Electoral Count Act. Understanding there was previously a proposal from Senator King, House Administration Committee has put forward some ideas. How are these things related on substance and how does that bode for the prospect of success for this bill? And Adav, we can start with you this time. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to start with that. So. Um, the, the, so the, the specific proposals referred to there, um, the House Administration Committee, which is the committee in the House that has jurisdiction over election issues, um, issued a report about the Electoral Count Act that included some sort of principles for reform, but I, I don't believe that um, a, a bill um, has emerged um, in, in the House to the, uh, uh, that would, um, uh, an ECA reform bill has emerged in the House. The, um, the other effort that was mentioned was a um, discussion draft and it was explicitly labeled a discussion draft, not an introduced bill um, by um, Senators um, King, Klobuchar and Durbin uh, several months ago. And as the Senator said at the time that they issued that, it was intended as a discussion draft to start the conversation or contribute to the conversation around um, fixing the ECA. Um, the announcement from the bipartisan working group today 
um, of the, the bill that was announced include a specific um, reference to an acknowledgement of consultation with um, Senator Klobuchar. And so I, there are ways in which I think those efforts have um, been uh, mutually rein reinforcing, um, but there is to this point only one actual bill that has been introduced to my knowledge in either House of Congress. Let me add a couple more, more political elements to this as well. I mean, one, there's a big overlap among the senators who are part of this reform effort and the senators who helped draft the infrastructure bill. And, and so they have a track record of identifying a kind of a political and policy sweet spot where you can attract bipartisan support in the Senate and draft a bill that um, Democrats who control the House and the president um, presidency also support. So I think that's an important um, element of the, of the prospects. And also I was involved with the University of Arizona's National Institute for Civil Discourse has a program called Common Sense America. And they, um, we, <laughs> I was involved with this, shared a lot of proposals for ECA reform with thousands of Americans across the country, Republicans, Democrats, independents. And essentially everything that's in this final version pulled off the charts in both parties. You know, huge bipartisan support. So th those, and, and that's been shared with, with staff on the Senate side. I don't know that how, how Vance said it's on the House side, but it's there and it will be, it'll be um, included. And, and they were also involved in the infrastructure bill and trying to push, you know, push something through. So um, those are some just sort of data points on the, on the politics. I'm sure you can reach out for the reporters on there. It's like Keith Allred at the National Institute for Civil Discourse to talk more about that. Thanks, anything to add, Trumpio? Yeah, I just want to jump in on the the sort of point that Trey is raising about sort of bipartisan prospects. Um, I think it's important not to lose sight of the fact that what we're seeing in this bill actually reflects a pretty strong cross-partisan consensus that we've seen not only in the form of the House administration report and the King and Klobuchar bill, but in you know among academics and scholars and lawyers and others, you know, outside of Congress. Um, and you know, it's a complicated topic, it's a complicated bill, and there's more than one way to, to write it potentially. But I think at a high level, if you look at sort of the common elements that are covered in what was released today and what we've seen either discussed or, or, or proposed in the past, there's, there's quite a lot there. And that importantly includes things like eliminating this failed election uh, provision um, and providing clarity on the, you know, the requirement that electors be appointed on specific day Congress has required. You know, clarifying the role of the vice president, raising the objections threshold, reducing, if not entirely eliminating the risk and threat of multiple slates of electors, um, and finding that good balance between the authority of states to conduct elections and submit their results and the requirement that Congress count those results with ensuring that states themselves also, you know, abide by the rule of law. Um, so I think, you know, at a high level, if you look at all these proposals, there's quite a lot of commonality, and I think that's actually pretty encouraging. Great, thank you all. Um, I'll move to a question here from Grace Panetta from Insider. How does the expedited judicial review process in this bill compare to or improve upon the existing judicial re uh, remedies and mechanisms for presidential election, presidential candidates to contest elections? And jean Viev, why don't you go back to back on this one and you can start. <laughs> Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll just be quick on this. Well, I mean, one easy answer is that the current electoral count tax says nothing about the role of the courts. And so there's, it's not entirely clear um, how, how to read the, the sort of existing authorities of the courts and the ECA together. And so that, that additional clarity combined with the expedited process that it provides for, which is critical. Um, and then also the requirement that Congress be bound by the decisions of courts, I think actually goes a long way towards shoring up um, what's already an existing sort of landscape of state and federal law. Um, I'll let Dov or, or Trey jump in with more. The only thing I would add is that one of the particular um, question marks around existing law is what happens if uh, a state just does not certify its presidential election results? That would seem to violate existing law, but but um, the current ECA is a little bit, or more than a little bit, the current ECA is pretty vague as to what happens in that situation. The bill would clarify that if, if a state just did not certify its results, there would be an opportunity for the federal court to rectify that situation. I don't have anything to add to those two articulate answers. 
<laughs> Thank you. Then we'll move to the next question. And Adav, we'll start with you on this one. This drills down a little bit more into judicial review. Are there any concerns that the six day window for judicial review would be too short if there are several disputes from the states? And Adav, you can start. Um, I think, I mean, it's, it's tight. The, the window in the bill for litigation is tight. I think history shows that the courts are able to expedite these cases um, as necessary. Um, and we certainly saw that with many, many cases in the 2020 election and also in the 2000 election. Um, uh, you know, I, anyway, I, I, it's tight, but courts will likely adapt as needed. Anyone else want to add anything on this topic? Okay. There's another question related to judicial review. Will this lead to presidential candidates just suing in swing states in every election, regardless of whether there's actually a dispute? jean do you want to go first on that one? <laughs> Look, like a dove might want to, but I'm happy to start. Look, I, what's, what's in this bill would not change the existing you know, opportunities for litigation in state and federal courts. So it, I don't, it can affect either way. Um, this creates an expedited process in a very specific and limited scenario, hopefully an extreme scenario in which, you know, a federal, the federal authority, usually the governor, um, has somehow failed to ascertain and certify to Congress results that, you know, are compliant with the law. That's a pretty extreme scenario. And so I, I it should not be triggered in many circumstances. Hopefully it won't be triggered in any circumstances in the future. Um, but no, I don't think this provision does anything to invite additional or frivolous litigation in that respect. And if it does, because lawyers sue, because that's what they do, right? And they file tons of lawsuits in battleground states, then the courts can expeditiously get rid of the claim. You know, like they don't need to take six, you know, so, so, uh, I mean, if, you want, if I want to be a little bit cynical about it and, and think that the campaign finance lawyers will, or campaign campaign lawyers, not finance lawyers, campaign lawyers will, will sell, file suits. Yeah, now there's some rules of the game and they'll get rid of it quickly and they'll lose. And and I would say, you know, if they really are frivolous and, you know, and we're watching this play out on some of the frivolous, um, the penalties that exist in our court system to prevent frivolous suits. And we're seeing bar, bar challenges and things like that. It'll be interesting to see, you know, you'd still have those policing mechanisms in something like this if you were filing something with no ground. And the only thing I'd add is there's a variation on this question um, that, that I've heard, which is, is this going to lead to um, winning candidates suing in every state to, to somehow confirm their victory? And the answer to that is, is clearly no. There is no, nothing in, in the bill provides for a candidate in that situation to sort of preemptively sue to confirm their own victory. Great. Thank you. And one more question on what important provisions did not make it into this bill that anyone was hoping to, or there disappointments in the compromise? Um, but the basic question is what's missing, if anything? I mean, I, it's for, for quite some time now, um, all the organizations represented here have been um, speaking about what the major necessary changes to the ECA are. Um, and so if you look at those and you look at what the bill does, I think they line up pretty well. I, I don't think there's any um, major uh, uh, fix needed to the existing ECA that isn't reflected um, in the bill. It's a compromise bill. Of course, there are, you know, you could quibble with words here and there. Um, that's the nature of a compromise. But big picture in terms of reducing the opportunities to sabotage, excuse me, to sabotage presidential election, um, it, it um, fixes the, the major problems in existing law. Anyone else have anything to add on that? Okay, I, there was a follow-up question from someone else that drills down a little bit. One of the grounds for objections in Congress in the current ECA is that the vote of one or more electors has not been quote unquote regularly given. And that language has been the subject of dispute 
How does this bill ensure that members of Congress can't abuse this vague language? And jean I think you can start this one. Yeah, I'll, I'll start. Look, this may be one of those things that if, if I could write it or Dov could write it, we might choose somewhat different wording, but I think a few things are important. It, I think the bill clearly distinguishes between the categories of objections, objections to uh, the appointment of electors, right? The slate submitted as to who won uh, and, and objections as to electoral votes, which I think is helpful. Um, and it now builds on what I think is a pretty solid sort of base of scholarship and understanding what the term regularly given means and what it importantly, what it does not mean. Um, uh, and so I think it's important to read it in that context. But in addition, you know, you read it in, in the context of the whole bill. So the clarity between the, the election, the different kinds of objections, the raising of the threshold um, and the other things that the bill does, I think sort of together um, should provide, you know, I think a lot, a lot of sort of comfort in terms of reigning in Congress um, and any concerns about Congress's role in, in objecting to, to legitimate and lawful state results. Thank you. Anyone else want to answer that? I think Jambi, I've covered it very well, but anyone have anything else? Okay, I think our last question this afternoon that I have is maybe a little revisiting Schoolhouse Rock, but where do things go from here? We've had this bill introduced. This is a big step. What does the process look like now that this has been introduced? I don't know. Secretary Grayson, you haven't had a first chance in a while, so I'll go to you first. Well, yeah, it's, so it's it's introduced and it, you know, it's just like any other bill. Um, now, we also know that there is another bill that was introduced that has some other election reform um, measures in it that are bipartisan, although it's not exactly the same number of sponsors. And so, you know, I think the expectation is, is that both of these bills will you know, if, if, well, the Senate can wait, can, you know, up and can just wave a rule, but in theory, committee and then then gets passed by the Senate, there, um, you know, will probably be a filibuster test vote. Um, and then it'll go to the go to the House. And then the question becomes, does it get combined with something else? Um, just because there's not a lot of legislating days left in this Congress, uh, because it's an election year. And, and so it, it's possible that this becomes part of some other law. Um, you know, another another must pass law. So procedurally, it's not clear, but you know, it does require the Senate's got to pass it, the House has to pass it. Um, you'll need a sixty vote um, threshold in the Senate, simple majority in the House, and then the President will presumably sign whatever send he sent was sent to his desk. Great, thank you, Adav or Javier. Anything to add? I just note that Senator Klobuchar has, I think, said publicly today that the Rules Committee will be holding a hearing on the Electoral Account Act. So, yeah. Yeah, and that's the committee of jurisdiction for election matters, for those who don't know. Great. Well, thank you all very much. I want to thank our speakers, Adav, Javier, Secretary Grayson, as well as our audience. Um, thank you for being with us and also for clearly digging into the substance to ask very good questions. Um, feel free to use any of the responses in your reporting, and please reach out to us after if you have any questions. Uh, my colleague is going to put Blake Jelly's email in the chat. So you have his, his email. It's also in our press release if you'd like to follow up. Thank you very much and have a good rest of the day.